Uh, information on parliamentary privilege and the protection of witnesses and evidence has been provided to you. For the Hansard record, could you please each state your name? Well, could you please state your name in the capacity in which you appear today? Certainly. My name is Richie Merzian, and I'm the director for the Climate and Energy Program at the Australian Institute, the capacity with which I'm now presenting. Thank you. Um, we've read your submission. Thank you for that. Would you like to make a brief opening statement, and then we'll ask questions and apologies for running over time. Um, yeah, we're trying to get it. Trying to get answers out of some departments is very difficult, as you, as you know. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and, and, and thanks, all senators, for the opportunity to appear before the inquiry. The Australia Institute is an independent, nonpartisan, public policy think tank based right here in Canberra. For our submission, which is number 19, we collaborated with Future Super, an ethical superannuation company, in the form of data sharing and feedback. One of our programs, Divest Invest Australia, is the local arm of a diverse global network united in the belief that by using our collective influence to divest from fossil fuels and invest in climate solutions, we can accelerate the transition to a zero carbon economy. It is through our Divest Invest program that we raise a number of points regarding the Great Barrier Reef Partnership Program, specifically around the handling of government funding by the Great Barrier Reef Foundation prior to its use for its designated grant activities. The foundation is in a fortunate position receiving six years of funding up front, and that funding now sitting in its bank accounts. <clears throat> it will take some time for the foundation to scale up and effectively disperse that funding. Our concern is that in the meantime, the funding is sitting in term deposits with the big four banks, Commonwealth, ANZ, NAB, and Westpac, as well as the Bank of Queensland and Suncorp. The big four are the largest funders of the fossil fuel industry in this country. Based on research by market forces, lending by the big four to the fossil fuel industry increased 50% between 2016 and 2017. This matters because the emissions associated with those funded fossil fuel projects over their lifetime are equivalent to five times the emission reductions that Australia will need to make in order to meet our Paris target. The foundation, by parking its money with these banks, is indirectly supporting the operations and growth of an industry that is directly contributing to the reef's greatest threat. This can change if the foundation adopts a divestment strategy regarding its banking and an investment policy to guide the use of its undispersed funds. Just one more thing, please. The Great Barrier Reef Foundation acknowledges that climate change is the biggest threat to the reef. And most Australians agree. Uh, the Australian Institute recently did polling, national polling as part of our Climate of the Nation 2018 report, which has been handled annually for the last 10 years by the Climate Institute and we've taken over recently, and they found that 77% of Australians are concerned that climate change is causing the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef. So this is important to most Australians. Therefore, the foundation and its directors must ensure that claims about climate change are accurate and based on sound research. I raise this because a foundation board member, Mr. Grant King, gave evidence earlier this week <coughs> Um, in support of a claim by the Business Council of Australia, which I understand he also chairs. The BCA claimed that a higher emissions reduction target in the order of 45% on 2005 levels by 2030 would be, I quote, economy wrecking. Mr. King supported this claim. Yet Mr. King admitted at the same time that he's seen very little analysis here in Australia of the effect of that on the economy. So the first thing I question is, how can he make that claim if there is an absence of research? And secondly, um, the Australian Institute has, has compiled a number of reports that go into this question, including a deep carbonisation by 2050 report by Climate Works and the ANU, by modelling by the Climate Change Authority, by the government's own treasury, and you know, a while back now, but by the Ghana Review. Mr King relies on one report in particular, which is from the International Monetary Fund that says that carbon prices in Australia will need to be higher than US $70 a tonne in order for Australia to meet its current targets. This he takes as evidence that there would be a significant economic impact. The study, however, does not support Mr King's claim. On the contrary, the study shows that carbon prices as high as US $70 a tonne would have almost no impact on the Australian GDP. The economic cost is around a quarter of a percent of the GDP in 2030. I have a copy of the report here by the IMF. It's a working paper. I'm happy to table this report if it would be of use to the committee. It is important for the foundation and the foundation's representatives to deliver on the foundation's goal, which is to bring hope for the future of the Great Barrier Reef, including through their communications. 
Thank, thank you, um, Mr. Mersey. And I, I might ask you, um, so in your submission you state the Foundation will need to manage conflicts of interest when uh, adopting investment policies. Is, is it specifically the banks you're, 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 you're talking about or, or is there also other, other uh, investment issues? Uh, our submission um, yeah, specifically highlighted the, the banks as an issue. Yeah. Um, so many of the banking partners that the foundation banks with also have representatives either on the foundation's board or on the chairman's panel. And for the foundation to approve, uh, say, an investment policy or a divestment policy, uh, it would then need the approval of its board. Uh, and many of these members uh, are involved in both camps. So that, that would present one conflict. Secondly, mm -hmm. if they do an, adopt an investment policy, which would be how they're going to direct their undispersed funding. It, it could also um, require exclusion of a number of companies um, whose representatives are also involved in the Great Barrier Reef Foundation. So there mm -hmm. are sort of two spaces where conflicts could occur. Okay. Um, are, you, are, you also, are, are you also concerned about broad, broader conflicts of interest with fossil fuel companies being on the chairman's panel for the, for the Barrier Reef Foundation? Yeah, in regards to the conflicts of interest that we raised, yes. Uh, in, in terms of the foundation now playing a leadership role, hmm. um, there's an opportunity for it to demonstrate that it is taking the threat to the reef seriously. And that includes in who it picks as its partners to carry forward its work, not just in terms of how it saves the reef, but also how it does its banking, how it deals with its money. And therefore, sort of involving representatives of the fossil fuel industry or the banking industry in its operations might complicate the matter. Okay. Is your argument um, that more that the reef is um, the Barry Reef Foundation now is, has to be held to higher standards in relation to climate climate impacts because of their their key role is to save save the reef or, or help the reef? Is that your key argument? Yes, that's, that's correct, Senator. Yep. Uh, okay. The, the foundation doesn't have an investment policy, so up to now it hasn't it, it doesn't have a at particular guidelines around how it spends its money before it's actually dispersed. Yeah. Isn't that mm. odd that it's operated since 1999? It claims it's raised $90 million, but it doesn't have an investment policy that we've seen to date. Uh, Senator, it, it is surprising, uh, especially since a number of board members are, are in the finance industry. Uh, I understand that one board member in particular who, who appeared in front of the committee in mm. particular has uh, experience in say ethical investment, green investment as well. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and we have been in touch and most recently about how the foundation could develop an investment policy in line with its mission. Could I follow up on that, Chair? Yeah. Um, has the foundation been in touch following the publication of your report? Uh, yes, uh, it has. Uh, so we published our report on the 11th of September. Uh, soon after, uh, Mr. Fitzgerald got in touch with our collaborator, Future mm -hmm. Super. Um, and stated that, that he would be responding to uh, the paper. Uh, and two days later, when I was able to follow up directly with Mr. Fitzgerald, he sent forward a response, a formal response on behalf of the foundation, uh, which I'm uh, happy to go into if that's of interest. Okay, no, then thank you. Well, keep, keep going if you uh, have more sure. questions, but you please. Oh, well, keep, no, keep, I didn't keep. want to, I inter no, inter okay. I no, inter no, no, interjected there. Uh, well, I might go back to Mr. Mm. King. Mr. King said when he came before us that there's an aspirational element to Paris that's not being detailed by any member country that I'm aware of. Do you agree that there are no other countries that are seeking more ambitious action uh, than the Paris uh, Agreement? So, so Senator, the, yeah. the, the proposition made by Mr. King was that no one is doing anything more than what they would said that what, what, what they would do in Paris. If that's, yeah. if that's the, the, the claim, then that's not correct. Uh, just last week, the EU commissioner stated that he'll be bringing forward a proposal to EU members uh, to increase their um, ambition. And that will be for members you know, across the entire EU. So those are countries that have larger emission profiles and smaller emission profiles than Australia. Uh, in addition, the Paris Agreement requires that all countries review their nationally determined contributions every five years. Mm -hmm. And so well before 2030, so in two years' time, Australia will have an opportunity to ratchet up its emissions reduction target, much like most other countries that have taken on these obligations. So there will be a movement to increase ambition. Mm -hmm. and, and just to be clear, that, 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 that 
movement to increase ambition is because the current targets aren't enough. That's correct, yeah. There's been numerous studies that show that if you aggregate the amount of targets that have currently been put on the table under the Paris Agreement, it would not get us to the goal of the Paris Agreement, which is to limit temperatures to a two degree rise. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Uh, Mr. King also said he was not aware of much research on Australian economics of the high, of regarding high ambition on climate change. I think what he was trying to get there to there, he wasn't aware of much research uh, looking at the impact in Australia, looking at the impact on the economy if we had a higher ambition on climate change. Are you aware of any such work? Uh, yes, I am. Senator, uh, I mean, the, uh, you know, the Treasury has, has published work modeling what different scenarios would look like. It was done under the Ghana Review. ANU and Climate Works uh, have put forward a, a long-term decarbonisation plan all the way to 2050 around what different scenarios could look like. The government's own climate change authority has also looked at this question. Uh, those are just a few off the top of my head. I'm, I'm happy to pull a longer list together if you'd like. Uh, that's very useful. We might put that to you on notice as well. Terrific. Thank you. I'm fine, Chair. Okay, thanks. Um, so you presented some figures um, regarding the lending by the big four to the fossil fuel industry mm -hmm. since 2008. Um, could you just tell us how you arrived at those figures, like what kind of sources you used? Certainly. Uh, so we relied on, on market forces uh, and they've compiled this based on public information around projects that have uh, sought, sought funding. Uh, and I believe there's around 17 major projects that were aggregated and, and that's where that number came up with. Uh, okay. and and ultimately, there, there, there's an uneven split between the big four in terms of who's funded what. Um, but collectively, they, they are taking on the lion's share of fossil fuel funding in this country. Okay. And um, do you know whether the banks, they have any, some of them have made different comments over the years about sustainability, how, where they stand on the Paris Agreement? So all four of the big four yeah. banks have publicly stated that they support the Paris Agreement okay. uh, in, in, in the broad. Uh, and some of those banks have taken steps further. So I believe uh, Westpac um, have stated that that, 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 will, um, that they've changed their position around supporting thermal coal mining, mm. uh, for example. Um, uh, but to the extent that they have adopted positions around fossil fuel lending and whether they're going to exclude fossil fuel lending, I don't think it's gone as far as that. Okay, but you said in, you said there's 50 banks and credit unions that are fossil fuel fossil investment free at the moment. Can you give us some examples? Sure. Uh, so the, the list is available on the link in our submission, but just off the oh, top okay. of my head, um, Bank of Australia, Beyond Bank, uh, Bendigo Bank, are just three banks uh, that operate locally that, that do have a, um, a divestment uh, and fossil free position. So it is possible to develop a um, an investment policy which screens for climate change and threats highlighted in the Reef 2050 plan. The fact you, you believe it's feasible, the Foundation could put together an investment plan for the, the $444 million that specifically accounted for those, those threats? Yes, we do believe it is so. And in addition, Mr Fitzgerald in, in his response stated that they are now working on an investment policy. Um, mm. It will include an exclusions element to it. So we'll okay. be interested to see what that actually does include but there is a possibility that they will take that on board and we certainly hope that they do. Okay. I mean, look, you've done, you've done it through the committee process anyway, but I know Senator Dunningham would probably ask you this question. Will you, have, you, have you contacted the Barrier Reef Foundation about this directly? Sorry uh, if I missed that, if you have. Yeah. This, the submission was sent directly to the executive director and the chair, Right. Um, okay. but it was, it was through another means with which Mr Fitzgerald responded and that was through our collaborator. Right, okay. Did you have any questions, no, uh, no. Senator, Senator Dunningham? Mm -hmm. Um, so you, you also note in your, in your submission that the foundation is required to align its investment policy with the Future Fund. Um, could you expand on your views on the limitations of the Future Fund's investment policies as well on environmental matters? So under the grant agreement, uh, the Foundation is obliged to align its investment policy mm. with the Future Fund. The Future Fund, unfortunately, is, is a laggard uh, when it comes to dealing with carbon risk. Uh, and this is by comparison to other sovereign wealth funds around the world. 
So under the Asset Owner Disclosure Project, which is a global rating of carbon risk management among the world's biggest funds, it rates the future fund uh, as having a D. Whereas by comparison, the Norwegian Sovereign Wealth Fund, which is a $1 trillion fund, uh, gets an A. And that comes down to how you manage um, climate change and carbon risk. So Norway's F Sovereign Wealth Fund is committed to divest from coal companies and has divested from other fossil fuel companies and applies carbon risk management across the entire portfolio. New Zealand Sovereign Wealth Fund has done a similar thing as well. Even um, four large Gulf states, uh, um, you know, which as, as we know make most of their revenue from fossil fuels, have agreed to sign up to investor principles for active shareholder engagement to ensure they only invest in companies that factor climate risk into their operations. The Future Fund has done none of this. So in regards to the Future Fund being an example for how you could develop an investment portfolio aligned with the reef's mission, uh, it, it wouldn't necessarily serve that, that purpose. Okay, just look, uh, we'll put some more questions on notice here. I'm, I'm sorry we've, we've, we've run out of time, but I do, I do, want, I do want to ask you do, you, do you think, does the Australian Institute have a view on whether the foundation going forward should be taking donations from fossil fuel companies? Do you see that as a conflict of interest? Or a good thing that they're contributing fu funds towards reef restoration and adaption? I, I, you can I take it on notice. Yeah, you, you, I, I think yeah. I'll take that one on notice, Senator. Okay. Yep. Great. Well, thank you for appearing today, and once again, apologies we were uh, we we're out of time, but we will put some some questions to you if that's okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. And so the committee will now suspend and return at one thirty.